Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and of course uh, thank you Terrapin for inviting me and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to share some of my views with you this morning. Of course I have a soft heart for the Middle East because I was just checking in this morning in the hotel and then uh, the uh, concierge asked me, have you ever been to Dubai before? So I said, yes, before you were born. And indeed, I, I came here in 1974 for the first time and there was really practically nothing here. And uh, since then, obviously, the whole region has developed immensely and I had the privilege to visit most Middle Eastern countries, including Iran and Syria. And so I have, uh, say, had a very, very nice experience in this region that was also culturally extremely uh, interesting and that is frequently overlooked by uh, Western observers of the Middle East. But I'm not here to talk about the past. Essentially, I started to work in 1970 on Wall Street and then in 73 I moved to Asia and ever since I lived in Asia. But one thing I just wanted to point out, because it relates to the presentation I'm making, in 1970, there was not a single investment bank that was a, a public company. All of them were private partnerships. And this is important to understand, if you have a private partnership, the risk profile or the risks the partners will take are, of course, of a different nature than if you play with other people's money. And so the whole culture of the investment business has changed enormously. Whereas a, a partner was liable with all his assets for also the other people's mistakes. Uh, today, essentially, if you're running a bank and you run it like a hedge fund, like Citigroup or so, and you go bust, essentially, it doesn't hurt you. So that has changed a lot in the financial service industry, and I'll talk about this in a second. What I'd really like to demonstrate today is that uh, the Keynesians, their idea is to intervene into the free market, into the capitalistic system with fiscal and monetary measures, and their idea, or the idea of Keynes, was to smoothen out the business cycle but I'd like to demonstrate that actually with these interventions, the business cycle has become more violent. We have more extreme fluctuations in economic activity and we have far more uh, financial volatility. The central problem is that the Keynesian always try to address long-term structural problems with short-run fixes and uh, the emphasis on creating bubbles to help the economy, whereas uh, the fact is that bubbles usually hurt the majority of market participants. To better understand this, the Federal Reserve's philosophy has been essentially over the last 30 years that you can't identify bubbles. But if a bubble bursts, you can undertake uh, measures that will support asset prices. In other words, in the words of Mr. Bernanke, you can flood the system with liquidity by dropping dollar bills onto the United States, and that will prevent uh, deflationary recessions from happening. I'd just like, as an aside, to mention that deflation is not necessarily bad. It depends on many other factors. But the point is, over the last 25, 30 years, each time there was a problem, the Fed slashed interest rates and injected liquidity into the system, starting with the SNL crisis in 1990, the tequila crisis in 94, and in particular LTCM in uh, 98. When they bailed out, LTCM gave a green signal to Wall Street, leverage up, you will be bailed out. One talked about the Greenspan put, and when Mr. Bernanke became Fed chairman in 2006, the view was that there would be a Bernanke put with a higher striking price. So you get the picture. But I'd like to now clearly explain what the problem of dollar dropping is. You drop dollar bills into this room, the Federal Reserve or any other central banks, and the others have done the same, the ECB and now the Bank of Japan and so forth, 
and the Bank of England. The problem is they can drop dollar bills and they can essentially more or less determine the quantity. What they cannot determine is what we will do with these dollar bills. And when you increase the quantity of money, there will be symptoms of inflation. The inflation does not necessarily have to show up in wage inflation in the United States or in consumer price increases in the United States. They we drop dollar bills onto this stage. The dollar bills essentially can flow down here or they can flow over there or over there and then they tr can create commodities inflation there or they can create an economic boom here in China with rising wages in China and rising inflation rates in China or they can create a boom in housing over here or in equities over there. That is essentially what's happening and the, the viciousness of this monetary inflation is that when we drop the dollar bills into this room, not every price will go up at the same rate and with the same intensity and at the same time. So what we will have is say you have first have a Nasdaq bubble, 98 to 2000, March 2000, whereas uh, when uh, essentially the Nasdaq between August 99 and March 2000 doubled, but Mr. Greenspan couldn't see a bubble. And then the market collapsed, so they slashed the interest rates here from 6.5% down to 1%. And we have the rapid credit expansion, and that created the housing bubble. And so first the NASDAQ bubble, then the housing bubble. The housing bubble also burst, and then they slashed again interest rates here to zero at the present time. And at the same time that they slashed the interest rates in 2007-2008, Commodity prices went ballistic to a peak in July 2008 when oil went up from the time they started to cut interest rates here, $78 to $147 in July 2008. And as I mentioned, you in increased the financial volatility by printing money. So from the peak of $147 in July 2008, Oil then dropped within six months to $32 in December 2008. That is the consequences of easy monetary policies. And this genius who populates the Federal Reserve says if it were possible to take interest rates into negative territory, I would be voting for that. You know what negative interest rates are? Is you have a deposit of $100,000 with a bank, and after a year you only get back $90,000. But it's been discussed in the economic literature because it would force people to do something with their money. In other words, they wouldn't save it. They would take it out and spend it. But some people would take it out and put it under the mattress and so forth. So it's a little bit difficult to implement practically. But what you can do, and this has happened, and this will be the case for many years to come, is to have negative real interest rates. In other words, here, you have in the 70s negative real interest rates. That was a period of the last big commodities boom with gold going from $35 to $850 an ounce uh, in uh, January 1980. Then we had a period of positive interest rates and then lately we have again negative interest rates. I have to point out to this. The way they calculate here real interest rates, in other words inflation adjusted, they take essentially the consumer price index the consumer price index does not reflect the cost of living increase of the typical household in the United States. I mean, I have really a large readership, and so I ask my readership, if anyone has the feeling that his cost of living are increasing by less than 5%, to please send me an email. So nobody sent an email except one person. He said, my cost of living have dropped 30%. I lost my girlfriend. <laughs> so I sent him an email back and said, you just wait until you see the replacement costs. <laughs> no, but it is a fact. I mean, most people, their cost of living are going much, up much more than what the governments are telling you the rate of inflation is. So we have negative real interest rates. What does it mean for an investor? Negative real interest rates mean that essentially if you take a 10 years view and you have cash and you put it 
on deposit, the purchasing power of that cash will go down. In other words, you're guaranteed to lose money. I would also suggest that negative real interest rates are negative for bond prices in the long run. In other words, they are inflationary. On the other hand, they are probably positive for some kind of investments. But as I said, you will have this volatility. NASDAQ first, then housing, commodities, and then the third may be equities in emerging markets or whatnot. But it, the problem for the investor is it doesn't happen all at the same time. The other thing is a client of mine told me, look, if I put my money on deposit, yes, I know I'm losing, say, 3 4% in real terms every year. So the purchasing power drops by 3 4%. But it's still better than to give my money to a Swiss bank and they lose 30% per annum. So I said, yeah, probably. <laughs> so you, you understand that is the tricky part. It penalizes also savers, people who have, you know, saved all their life to put the money on deposit. They never speculated in their lives. You force them to speculate now. The other unintended consequence of easy monetary policies is that essentially commodity prices in the last few years have gone up more than they would have uh, had interest rates been high in real terms. We have long-term commodity cycles. I don't want to repeat everything here. But basically, these long cycles, these are price cycles, not business cycles. They last 45 to 60 years. And so you have these peaks in commodity prices. And the last peak was here in January 1980. And then we were in a bear market for commodities until 1998. And as a result of the incremental demand uh, coming from China, commodity prices started to go up. But they went up more because of easy monetary policy. So you had a huge boom in some commodities, as uh, we shall see. And that has, of course, also implications socially, because during the rising wave of commodities, you have shortages. And because not every group of a society consumes the same quantity of commodities as a percent of his income, it hurts the lower classes of society more than the well-to-do people, as I shall explain in a second. The next unintended consequence, and I have to re-emphasize this because until, say, two years ago, hardly anyone talked about excessive credit growth being destabilizing. Here you have debt as a percent of the economy. You can see in the 1920s it went up strongly. And then we had the 1929 crash, the depression years. And then we have a long period of deleveraging, where debt to GDP drops from 186% in 29 to around 140% here. When the US went into World War II in 1942, we were at 140% debt to GDP. And in 1980, we're still at 140% debt to GDP. But under the influence of these Keynesians, the overall level of debt makes no difference. One person's liability is another person's asset. Go explain that to the Greeks or to the French banks and so forth. Under this influence, nobody paid any attention to the excessive credit growth that occurred over the last 20 years. In particular, Mr. Bernanke and Mr. Per uh, Greenspan they totally disregarded this excessive credit growth during the period 2000 to 2007. Credit increased in the US at five times the rate of nominal GDP. And whereas here in 29, we had a debt to GDP ratio of 186%, and now we have a debt to GDP ratio of 379%. The difference, and this is an important point, is in 29 we didn't have Social Security, we didn't have Medicare and Medicaid, and now we have them, and the unfunded liabilities. These are liabilities that are coming due, which have not been funded. So if you added these unfunded liabilities, we'd be up there in the fifth floor of this building, that to GDP. But you, as an investor, you have to think, what are the implications of this? Obviously, in my opinion, the US will continue to pursue expansionary monetary policies. They'll have to monetize debt continuously. 
and that will have a negative impact, obviously, on the value of the US dollar, very clearly. But the value of the US dollar may depreciate, and the other currencies may also depreciate at an even faster rate. That depends. But it will depreciate against something. I'd like to also explain very briefly why I don't think that this deflation, uh, debt deflation theory will happen right now. You see the super bears, the deflation is that everything will collapse and therefore you should be in 30-year US government bonds at the yield of 3% and in 10 years at uh, notes at the yield of less than 2%. But, and that the Dow Jones will collapse to less than 1,000. But I don't think this will happen for the simple reason that the Federal Reserve and the Treasury in the US, and by the way also other central banks around the world, that never paid any attention to excessive credit growth, they started to pay attention to credit growth when on the private sector it collapsed. You can see here, we have an acceleration of credit growth until 2007. And then in 2008, the private sector contracts, they save more, banks tighten lending standards and credit growth turns negative for a while. In other words, there was a contraction here. Now, the Fed and the Treasury that never paid any attention to this excessive growth in credit, they panicked because they realized the US economy is a credit addicted economy. You don't give credit where economy, economy collapses. So the government comes in through fiscal deficits and through monetization and offsets the private credit growth contraction through government credit expansion. Just like to mention one point, of course, the government's credit expansion is less productive than, say, if the private sector expands credit. But, uh, but basically what you have is now here a, a system that creates incredible volatility. And many observers and fund managers, they didn't understand that after the credit crisis of 2008, when private credit contraction exceeded the government's credit creation and asset prices collapsed, starting 2009, the world credit expansion from government side exceeded the private credit contraction and asset prices went ballistic up to this very date. So that creates increased volatility and an additional word about the US government debt. We took 200 years to reach a trillion dollars in 1980. By 2000, we were at slightly over $5 trillion. We are now at essentially $16 trillion, but that doesn't include the unfunded liabilities that I has just mentioned. So my view would be the government debt in the US that has trebled in the last 10 years will again double or treble in the next 10 years. And that will become very, very burdensome on the system. The problem being that spending is very difficult to cut in the US. Half the households in the US, they have one person that receives some kind of a contribution from the government or subsidies and over 49% of individuals don't pay any federal income tax. That means these people that have the ability to pay, the rich people, the 1%, if you took everything away of their income annually, it would make much of a difference on the fiscal deficit. So this will continue at a very high level. In my opinion, the fiscal deficits in the US will remain above a trillion dollars, more likely above one and a half trillion dollars for the foreseeable future. The problem is these mandatory expenditures, this is what has to be paid for social security and for Medicare and Medicaid, and it's already at 75% of the budget. Eventually it will be all the budget. Where will the, the income come for other expenditures of the government? Earlier, I mentioned that money printing has a socially undesirable impact because of the following. Take, for instance, a country like India or Vietnam or <coughs> parts here of the Middle East where per capita incomes are very low, say 
$2,000 a year or $1,000 a year. So these people essentially, they will spend roughly 50% of their income on food and energy. If you're a partner at Goldman Sachs and you earn $10 million, it's not likely that you will spend 50% on food and energy, unless you have a very high consumption of cocaine. But <laughs> you understand? The richer you are, the smaller the portion you spend on food. And the poorer you are, the larger the portion you, uh, of your income you spend on food. And so in an environment of rising energy and food prices, the lower income groups, they suffered their wages, particularly in the Western world, went up less. Then the cost of living increases, and so the real wages, the real incomes have been going down. And who benefits the most if you drop the dollar bills onto a system? These are the people that have assets, the well-to-do people, because they have the assets, so the assets appreciate irregularly, but they appreciate. Whereas the people who have no assets, obviously they lag behind. So you have wealth inequity increasing, as you can see here. And that usually leads to redistribution through taxation, or revolutions, or you have geopolitical problems. So this is uh, one of the problems of uh, essentially printing money. Now I have to explain another point that is very important to understand. The US, by creating bubbles, they allowed essentially households to consume more temporary than would have otherwise been the case. In particular, with the housing bubble, households were allowed to take money out of their homes by refinancing the mortgages and so forth. And then they went and spent that money. So as a percent of the economy, consumption went up and capital spending turned negative net. In other words, the depreciation were higher than the net new capital investment. So the US consumes, has a housing boom, consumes more, leads to overconsumption, is not accompanied by capital spending increases and industrial production increases to speak of. And so that leads to a huge trade and current account deficit rising from $150 billion here in 1996 to over $800 billion in 2006, 2007. And uh, obviously, if you have a trade deficit, someone has to have a trade surplus. And to make sim things simple, say, China had a trade surplus. So the US consumes, and China produces. So you drop the dollar bills into the US, allows the US to consume, but where the stimulus goes is into the industrial production of China to supply the US with the goods that create this deficit. And so industrial production goes up in China, employment goes up in China, wages go up in China, capital spending goes up in China, domestic consumption increases, infrastructure expenditures increase, and all that drives the demand for commodities. And so after this period, 1980 to 1998, during which commodity prices went down, the raw material producers of the world, they have a bonanza, prices go up, they produce more, and so essentially the American monetary policies didn't stimulate economic activity in the US, but they stimulated economic activity overseas. And so for the first time in the history of capitalism, you have a new world. The center of economic activity shifted essentially from the old world Europe and the US to uh, mostly emerging economies. As you can see here, as a raw economic indicator for the first time, you have oil consumption in the rest of the world larger than in Japan, the US and Europe. And uh, you have also a change in the trading patterns in the sense globalization was designed for the Americans to basically dump their surplus products onto the world. They succeeded with some products like McDonald's and Coca-Cola and so forth. But you have to understand, the Chinese had an increased demand for commodities. So they buy more oil from the Middle East, they buy more iron ore and copper from Australia and from Brazil and so forth and so on. 
But the Chinese were very smart. <coughs> they started to also sell their products to these countries. So if you look at, say, the period here, 1995 to today, the G7 countries, as a percent of global trade, their share has been going down. Whereas the share of emerging markets as a percent of global trade has been going up. So you really have a huge shift in the balance of economic power from the West to essentially the emerging world. And that creates obviously huge uh, economic tensions, changes in the economy, and also geopolitical tensions. The way to play it in the last 10 years, this increase in the demand for raw materials from China, has been essentially to own industrial commodities. You can see the share of China of aluminum, copper, zinc, nickel, and this has never happened before in history, in economic history, has gone from 10% of world's consumption here 10 years ago to now between 30 and 40% in 10 years' time. It's a huge change. And so industrial commodity prices went up a lot. In the case of copper, we never had a 10 years period during which copper prices increased this much. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that today, in China, they have already, in many commodities, say, between 40% for copper and for cement, 53% of world's consumption. So you have to ask yourself, yeah, in the last 10 years it was right to own industrial commodities, but what about the future? Because when you are in the early stages of economic development, obviously it's a goods economy, so the demand for commodities goes up very substantially. But as you turn into a more service-oriented economy, the demand flattens out. Here you have South Korean oil demand, 1986 to 93, goes up strongly, goes flat. I don't think that we are there in China in the case of oil, but I think we are there in China in the case of some other commodities. And concerning China, I would like you to really consider the following. If the US economy grows or contracts by 2%, is meaningless for the price of industrial commodities. Because the US is 70% consumption, the economy. And of the 70% consumption, 70% are services. Services hardly require any commodities. In the case of China, it's a goods in economy, the same for Vietnam, the same for India. And in the case of China, we had normalized growth 2000 to 2007, but after 2007, the Chinese had, as a percent of the economy, an even larger fiscal deficit, and they printed money. After all, the Chinese invented money, uh, paper. And so you had a huge credit expansion here that led to symptoms of inflation, particularly in the property market and excesses in the property market. And so, as far as I'm concerned, we had a bubble in China that is now being deflated, and people say, well, it's going to be a soft landing. Look, I've known all my life economists. I've very seldom seen an economist say, we will have a crash. They all say, oh, it will be a soft landing. Even before the worst financial crisis at the Treasury, and Mr. Bernanke said, oh, the crisis in the housing market is well contained. It won't have an influence on the economy. Well, I think the Chinese economy could crash. And for sure, right now, there is hardly any growth in the Chinese economy. And that, uh, therefore, I would be relatively careful about industrial commodities. And besides that, industrial commodities are very volatile in price. You take here the price of cotton. Th three years ago, it was at 40 cents. Then it went up five times. And then within three months, it dropped 50%. These are commodity price movements, right? Be a bit careful. The other point that, and I have to exclude here Dubai, I happen to think the Middle East will go up in flames. But like during World War II, Switzerland did okay. So Dubai may be all right. But uh, I think the social tensions here will increase dramatically. And uh, the issue, the larger issue is this, 
The US, they have access essentially to oil from different sources, Canada, Mexico, Venezuela, Ecuador, uh, Angola, and uh, Nigeria, and the Middle East, and the North Sea. And they can have access to the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, and so forth. The Chinese, they have access here to the East and South China Sea, but they're surrounded by military and naval bases of the Americans. Plus, the Americans have 11 aircraft carriers. And 95% of the oil that goes here into northern ports of China comes here from the Middle East along the sea lanes. Now, if you were running a country of 1.3 or 1.4 billion people, and you depend 95% on oil from the Middle East, obviously, the top priority is to get oil and secure the, uh, the shipping lanes. But each time China undertakes some moves to build port facilities here around uh, the Indian Ocean, uh, it's perceived as aggression. But for the Chinese, this is a top priority to secure the oil. And so I believe that the tensions here in Central Asia will increase and the Middle East. The Americans, they know very well, and the Western power, they cannot contain China economically because China is already a very large economy, has 1.4 billion people and so forth. But one way to contain China is to switch on and switch off the oil tab from the Middle East. That is one way they can control China. And I think this uh, has now also dawned on to the Chinese that this is a threat to their security. And so I think the tensions will increase. Aside from domestic, uh, Social problems in the Middle East, in uh, especially countries that have a large population like Egypt. In any event, believe it or not, I think that this is uh, going to be a very, very uh, a powder keg, and that this could uh, really have an impact on asset markets. Exactly how you should position yourself if war breaks out is probably that you have to own assets such as commodities because during war times commodity prices go ballistic. Rising commodity prices lead to tensions. During war times they go ballistic. Equities probably will be okay, bonds less so in my opinion. The issue is China, so oil demand has trebled in 15 years from 3 million barrels a day here in 1996 to now 9 million barrels, in the case of India the same, but they are much lower, from 1 million to 3 million barrels. But India will have a larger population in 15 years than China. So I think the oil demand will go up, and the per capita consumption is tiny compared to countries like Japan and uh, Korea and the US. So I think that the demand for oil will go up, and that we could actually see significantly higher oil prices. Now someone asked me, what happens if oil prices go to 150 or 200 dollars, it's not a prediction. I'm just saying we have to think what would happen. Well, I said, well, for sure, Mr. Bernanke will print more money. For sure. And so the commodities will go even higher. So this is uh, one way to protect yourself to be in some uh, commodities. I believe we don't know how the world will look like in five years' time. I recommend to be diversified. I would have roughly 25% of my assets in cash and bonds. I don't like bonds, but you know, sometimes in life you have to do things you don't like. <coughs> then I would have some, say, 25%. I wrote here in Asian real estate. I was recently in Atlanta and in uh, Phoenix. I think uh, properties in uh, the south of the US are dirt cheap. Very, very cheap. For institutions, difficult to capitalize on, but as an individual, you can buy homes for, say, 40% discount to the construction cost at the low level, really. I mean, I live in Thailand. I can tell you homes in Thailand, of course, not luxury homes, but say for uh, the middle class and lower classes are inexpensive. But I've seen in America homes that are cheaper. I mean, mind-boggling. And then equities, I would have some equities and precious metals, obviously, and I will explain to you now why I would have equities. I said before that uh, we have negative real interest rates. In the late 70s, you may recall, some of you who were born already then, 
there was a petrodollar boom because the oil price had gone up from three dollars a barrel in 1970 to close to fifty dollars on the spot market in 1980 the opec countries had huge surpluses they deposited these surpluses with american banks the american banks lent it to latin america so we had a credit boom in latin america and an economic boom after 1980 the oil price no longer went up then 85 it collapsed and we had the so-called petrodollar crisis the reaction of latin american governments including mexico was large fiscal deficits and to print money and so inflation accelerated and uh, one of the symptoms of this accelerating inflation was a collapse in their currencies everywhere in latin america in the case of mexico the mexican peso between 79 and 1989 went down by 98 percent against the u.s dollar so if you invested here in 79 in Mexico, you exchange your dollars in Mexican peso, after the currency dropped 98%. What was the way to protect your wealth in Mexico? What was the worst investment? The worst investment were government bonds with a fixed coupon, say 10%. Cash was slightly better because as inflation accelerated to 100%, the interest rates on cash also went up, but it remained negative, so you had, say, inflation 100%, but the cash deposit rate went up from, say, 5% to 60%. So, but at least you were better off than in government bonds. What about equities? You see, in an inflationary period, as I mentioned, some symptoms of inflation will come up, either in homes or in commodities or in equities, not all at the same time. So what happened in Mexico is Eventually, stocks adjusted on the upside because of the high rate of inflation. So you have the local index going here in 79 from essentially 1,000 to a peak of 343,000 in 87. Then we had a global crash in 87, everything went down, but we still finished at 139,000. So the index in local currency goes up from 1,000 to 139,000. In the meantime, the currency drops 98%. Did we make money or lose money? We can translate the local index into US dollar index. So what you have is essentially an index where the stocks go up, as I just showed, but the currency goes down, but we adjust it continuously every year. So we start here in dollar terms between 48 and 70, and we drop to 5, and then we go up to 220 and close at 62. From start to end, at least in stocks, you maintained your purchasing power. It wasn't a very good deal, but you maintained your purchasing power. But the interesting aspect about this is the following. You see, in the period 79 to 83, the currency collapses. But stocks didn't react much on the upside in local currency. You see the index is around 1,000 here. By 83, we just had doubled to about 2,000, and the low was 800. So say, we went up a little bit. So in dollar terms, the currency collapses, but the stock market goes up only slowly. In dollar terms, we went down from 70 to 5. At 5, the market was unbelievably cheap. I went to Argentina in uh, 1987. You could have bought the entire stock market of Argentina, essentially all the big uh, industrial groups, for 750 million US dollars. And the same happened in Brazil. High inflation brings, monetary inflation brings these distortions in the price mechanism and this volatility. So if you entered the market here in 83, what subsequently happened, the currency continued to collapse, but stocks went ballistic from here, roughly 1,000 in 83 to 343,000 in three years later. So in dollar terms, you went from 5 to 220. You had a huge gain. What I want to say here is really, we live in an environment of money printing. You have to live with a lot of volatility and it doesn't pay to be overly dogmatic. I think uh, equities probably made a major low on March 6, 2009, when the S&P was at 666. 
I don't think we will revisit that low anytime soon. I believe if the S&P drops 200 points here, you have QE3, QE4, QE5, and so forth and so on. And if the Chinese economy slows down, the Chinese will also print money massively. And I would therefore own some gold. I don't think gold is in a bubble. A bubble is characterized by essentially a, a very rapid acceleration on the upside. You have here the last bubble. By the way, the Middle East was a big participant in the last gold bubble. The whole world was speculating day and night, but especially here in the Middle East because we had excessive liquidity in 79. In 79, in November, the price of gold is still around $400. Then we have a break gap, breakaway gap, continuation gap, and within less than three months, we doubled in price to $850 in January 1980. Then we have a big collapse. That is a bubble. When prices accelerate on the upside, when they go parabolically up, like NASDAQ doubled August 99 to March 2000, that is not the case uh, about gold. And by the way, in this room, since you're all intelligent people, how many of you own of your assets, let's exclude your personal businesses, like if you have a shop or a, I don't know what kind of a business. But anyway, if you have, a, with those of you who have more than 5% uh, of your assets in gold, please lift your hand. Now you look around, you tell me whether that is a bubble. In 2000, if I ask, had asked you how many of you have more than 50% in NASDAQ stocks, Everybody would have lifted his hands. Or in 89, how many of you have everything in Japanese stocks? Everybody would have been in Japanese stocks. This is what institutions have in gold compared to the rest. I don't believe that this is a bubble. But, you know, we went up strongly. We made a peak in September, on September 6, 2011, at 1,921. Then we dropped on December 29th of last year to 1,522. In my view, we're still in a correction period. But I think you should all, you're intelligent, you should all put every money, every month, a little bit of money in gold, buy some coins. And if it dropped sharply, so, because my asset allocation has this cash, so essentially, if either equities drop a lot or if precious metals drop a lot, you can then allocate more to that investment which has essentially declined substantially. So basically I would own some gold. I am ultra, ultra bearish about everything. As I recently remarked, sometimes when I look at the global economic and geopolitical situation, I feel like committing suicide. But you have to understand, you have to think it through. If you're very, very bearish about everything, are you better off in cash, in government bonds, in equities, or in precious metals? There's also another issue. I was a few days ago in Singapore. They have built a huge uh, storage facility for precious metals, for diamonds, and for paintings. You have also to consider where you want to hold your assets, because if you hold assets, say gold in the US, for sure it will be taken away one day by our socialist president. <coughs> so I would say uh, I would own some precious metals and equities. Consider Germany, last 120 years, people that had their money in cash and bonds, they lost it three times. World War I, hyperinflation, World War II. If you had Siemens and BASF, you still have something, may not have been the greatest investment on earth, but you have it. If you have real estate in Germany, if you had the unfortunate luck to have it in East Germany, you lost everything. West Germany, you're okay. So that real estate, you also have to diversify. Don't have all your real estate in Dubai, or all of it in the UK, or all of it in the US. I would diversify between different regions of the world. And I would own essentially real estate in the countryside, because I think you know financial centers and city centers are very vulnerable to cyber wars, to uh, biological warfare, and so forth and so on. 
I mean, you switch off the electricity here in Dubai, it's not going to be very pleasant. In your country home, you can survive. You have a few cows and chicken and so forth, and the wife can look after them. <laughs> and so, <laughs> or the girlfriend, and it'll be, be, be okay. So, my worry is really, in the Western world, we have a good idea, you know, social state, people support the poor and this and uh, franchise people. And now we have essentially few people and fewer and fewer people supporting more and more. It doesn't add up. The states are bankrupt under the current system, including Japan probably in the long run. And you know, when you have a crisis, and you print money, and you force additional credit expansion, the, the excessive credit caused the crisis. Now you inject more credit, but this time government credit into the economy. You postpone the problem but you don't solve it. And uh, usually what then happens, wealth inequality increases, uh, the people, the masses become dissatisfied, so you have to give handouts, and eventually their lot doesn't improve at all because uh, all the income gains that they may have are offset by rising uh, cost of living increases. And then eventually the governments will go to war. And then the whole thing will collapse, all the derivatives. So, you know, you also have to be very careful about the custody. MF Global went bust and the customers lost the money. It wasn't correctly done. And that is a big threat to the system. So I would take precautions uh, for at least yourself. What you do for your clients is another story. Thank you very much for your attention.